Hey everyone, welcome to Arms Armor and Awesome. Uh, this is construction of the scabbard for the Legend of Zelda Master Sword. Techniques I'm going to go over would uh, work pretty well for any uh, scabbard that needs to be constructed of a similar design. The, uh, the tools, techniques involved in it are pretty simple. Um, I use a few things that just make it easier. There's no sense in hand sanding when you have a belt sander. First step is uh, I have the uh, uh, bl blank of wood that's uh, significantly wider than the blade is. And you can see I'm applying two strips. These are actually going to be the entire thickness of the scabbard. And then I'm going to put a, another piece on top of that to create the enclosure. Two things. A, always make it a little bit wider than you think it needs to be. Uh, I'm talking about internally, so the blade slides very smoothly in and out. Um, and second, as you can see here in this one, uh, make sure to line the inside of your scabbard. The last thing you want to do is all this hard work on a nice sword, only to find out that when you put it in the, actually inside of the scabbard, you've scratched all your paint off. So, you can see that I'm doing some uh, finishing work here. Um, the lines are actually where I'm going to cut the scabbard at, so that I know how wide uh, to... Uh, for the finished product. Like I said, we always start a little bit larger. It's easier to remove material than, uh, than to add to it. You'll notice there I'm doing a lot of test fits. Um, you always want to check, make sure that your blade is a, a clean, smooth slide in and out of the uh, out of the scabbard. You don't want to have any problems with, uh, with that come later. Once you put this thing together, you're pretty much uh, without an option on going back unless you want to rebuild a whole new one. The end piece down there is not to actually stop the blade, but it will actually act uh, as part of the bottom of the, the scabbard because I'm going to have to shape this thing still. I need to make sure there's material down there so when I cut it, I don't end up with a hole at the bottom of the scabbard. That wouldn't look very right. What I'm doing here is actually masking off the scabbard itself. I'm applying a layer of felt inside, uh, real cheap, simple, get it from the craft store uh, felt, nothing special about it at all. The, uh, the spray glue makes a fantastic adhesive, uh, especially for this purpose, uh, just mask off the scabbard, I didn't want to get any extra laying around. And then I'm actually doing two layers here so the blade will be uh, very snug inside the scabbard. I probably could have gotten away with one. There are ways to improve the fit of the blade and to make it more secure that can be added afterwards uh, because I went with four layers inside the scabbard I never ran into that problem on this one you also notice that uh, I actually made a mistake on this one I didn't apply any felt to the side to the insides of the scabbard um, that was a mistake on my part I realized it afterwards and uh, uh, need to do some modifications so real simple wood glue. Um, this stuff is uh, meant for wood, use it for wood. That's why they call it wood glue. Don't try and uh, use Elmer's glue. Don't try and use epoxies. Don't use anything else. Use the right glue for the right right thing. Um, you can never have enough clamps, if you can't tell. Alright, so we moved on. Table saw. There we go. Trim down the edges. I knew how wide I wanted this thing to be, so I'm cutting off the extra material. Like I said, it's always better to have too much than too little. All right, nice clean cut. Ended up with two clean pieces, and now I have a nice square edge on the scabbard as well, so that I know I'm working from a good clean shape. I had to. Uh, this one's a little bit of uh, educated guesswork. Um, I needed to shape the bottom of the scabbard, obviously. Uh, into more of a uh, the round shape that you see. I know that there's wood down there. I can't see it obviously, but I know it's there. I put it in, and I know it fits the exact dimensions of the blade. So this was a little bit of educated guesswork, a little bit of intuition, and uh, it just kind of comes with an artist's eye, unfortunately. Would there be a way to do this prior to? Yeah, absolutely. You could draw this on. Um, I think I was a little bit of a rush, and uh, it was probably late at night when I was doing this.
All right. In order to minimize the amount of time that I was going to spend on the uh, belt sander, I actually used my saber saw to uh, remove a large majority of the material. As you can see there, right tool, right job. Uh, could I have done that on a power on a belt sander? Yes. Would it have taken me probably another 25, 30 minutes of sanding? Well, yes, it would have. This is, once again, no right way, but if you have the tools available to you, use them. Right here you'll see me, I'm actually adding the uh, template uh, and double checking the fit, making sure it's a square, a squared up to the uh, shape of the scabbard. I want to make sure that that thing's good and round and that I'm not, uh, not going to go too far one direction or the other because unfortunately at that point you're going to be f trying to find a way to add material and uh, that's almost impossible in this situation. I do a lot of hand fitting. This one's uh, unique in that notion. Um, when we take it to the belt sander, um, this one really is just eyeballing it. There's no true way to make marks down the length of it uh, regarding how much material to remove. Due to the fact that I am putting a round edge on this, um, there is the option, I guess, you could take it across a router table. I don't have one, uh, so in this case, I'm using a belt sander and a whole lot of... Uh, uh, I don't know, like 90% 90% skill on this one, and uh, there's a, certainly a degree of luck just because you can go overboard in a quick hurry. I found out that it was a lot easier in this case to uh, set the curve um, at the top of the scabbard and then bring that same angle, same amount of bevel down the length of the scabbard rather than trying to work the entire thing at once. That's a little bit one of those learn from my uh, my mistakes sort of thing. Work smooth, work uh, consistent though. That's the best thing I can give you for advice on uh, a belt sander. Just try not to sit in one spot and try and get it right. Uh, unfortunately, when you come back and try and work another part, you tend to uh, you tend to hit the part that you've already worked on. So, so you can see I'm working the the sides all equally. I'm not spending any any large amount of time on any one piece. And I'm also working the uh, bottom of the scabbard, or the rounded part, to make sure. You always want to make sure you have good hold on your uh, on your tools. Um, this thing, if I had let it go, probably would have launched 25 or 30 feet down the street and uh, would look pretty weird. Could this be done without a belt sander? Yes, absolutely. Um, you can either do it by good old hand sanding or any number of other tools that, would, that has an abrasive wheel on it. You could do this with a Dremel if you have enough time and patience. Um, if, uh, if this is not something that you want to try and tackle um, by other means, then yes, there are other techniques and I've seen other people do it um, from everything from fiberglass to, heck, you could make a, a pretty nice scabbard out of uh, cardboard if you really wanted to put the time and effort into it. Um, it's really a matter of whatever you feel comfortable with and whatever you have access to. The whole process, I probably spent a good part of a hour on the belt sander just trying to get this thing into what I would consider be a good good shape. Um, as you can tell, um, and it's just a habit of mine, I tend to work everything with a hand um, hand sanding. I find it to be a lot, uh, I don't know, I like the uh, the finish and the, the end result a lot more when I've done it with hand. I've never had a power tool that's uh, turned out a perfect product for me. I almost always end up with, in this case, uh, I think I was using 80 grit for rough shaping, and I ended up at uh, about a 300, 320 grit for a final cleanup on the uh, scabbard to make sure I had a nice, smooth, clean product before going forward. Alright, this is heavily sped up, but uh, you guys will get the idea as far as what I'm doing. I'm using a pr tool called a scroll saw. If you've watched any of my other videos, you've probably seen it. What I'm doing is I'm cutting out the details that will be applied to the scabbard. Uh, this is about 
one sixty fourth inch thick. Uh, it's actually a PVC board um, designed for shower stall backing. Um, it's very similar in nature to uh, Sintra um, or any number of other plastic sheet products that you can purchase for hobby and model making. I happen to have this on hand, and I happen to have a lot of it on hand, so in this case it worked out perfectly. It is a it is able to be formed like all plastics under a heat gun and you'll see me do that in a little bit. I actually uh, just take the heat gun and hand form it over the shape of the scabbard. Now all my pieces are actually cut extra wide so that I will have plenty of material to wrap around the scabbard and cut off the extra. This ensures that I'm not trying to bend the last little bit down flat and actually have a lot more than I need and can cut it away uh, the extra that I don't need. If you have access to a scroll saw, this is exactly the type of stuff it was designed for. If you don't, this uh, same effect could be achieved with an X-Acto knife. Uh, once again, it's simply a matter of the tools you have and the tools you feel comfortable with. Uh, never be afraid of power tools. should definitely respect them, but, uh, but never be afraid of them. Alright, um, this plastic that I'm using has a minor texture to it. Um, I spent 15-20 uh, yeah, minutes actually sanding off uh, most of the texture that I could get rid of. I thinned the plastic out a little bit, obviously because I had to remove some material, but uh, the overall result seemed to be, uh, be pretty good. Um, right now I'm just cleaning up any rough edges and burrs with a little bit of uh, hand sandpaper to make sure that uh, I have a good clean application. I don't want to be trying to clean that stuff up once it's already applied. When I actually got to the application process, um, I've done things like this before. It wasn't terribly tricky. Uh, if you have somebody to help you though, I would recommend it. Uh, this is the sort of thing that, that two hands really are better than one uh, just because of the fact that you are dealing with such, uh, such precise pieces that you really don't want to end up having to cut out tw two or three times. All right, there you can see the uh, the heat gun. Um, I actually have it set up in a vertical position there, and uh, I just work each piece one at a time. For a few of these pieces, you can see that I actually glue the center down first uh, onto the flat portion of the scabbard, and then I actually work the sides down flat uh, afterwards. This ensures that it's not moving and I'm not getting the bend in the wrong place. All these were attached with nothing more than super glue. Um, that's my primary use. Uh, there are other glues that could be used. Super glue just happens to be the fact. Uh, well, it's dry in three to five seconds and holds really darn well. The biggest problem I see with people using super glue is they tend to use too much. Um, strangely enough, the uh, the less super glue you use, usually the better it will hold. Two or three daubs of it is is really all you need for a normal piece of anything maybe a drop of it per inch or so of material. You can see here on the sides that as I heat it, form it, I bend it over and then I cut away the extra material like I was talking about. The sword is inserted into the scabbard for this top piece so that I can make sure I get the alignment correct. I would hate to end up applying some of the stuff only to have to rip it off. So you can see I have to fold those pieces all the way around heat and fold it around, heat and then I fold it around. There's another piece going on the opposite side so fold it over and this is where I take my X-Acto knife and cut off the extra material that I don't need. I've already marked uh, lines down the side of the scabbard so that I ensure that I'm actually cutting off the center or cutting down the, the center of the scabbard. I don't want to cut too far left or right. If there is any gap left, it can be filled in. Uh, there's quite a few different products that you could use to fill in extra material or any holes that you have uh, created during this process. Um, I actually go over most of the uh, scabbard with Bondo um, Automotive Auto, Auto Body Filler. It uh, works pretty well for this purpose. Um, and I happen to have a you know five gallon bucket of it laying around, so that doesn't hurt either. 
You could use anything from modeling paste. You could use a self-hardening epoxy putty. Um, there's a few different other options that you have to, uh, to finish this up. You see me just cleaning up some extra little bits that I got wrong there. Just using an exacto. The whole uh, body of this thing is actually primed with a gray automotive primer just to ensure the fact that I have good adhesion with the paint when I come back over it here on the initial coat. Uh, Super glue seems to stick to it pretty well and it being it adheres to the material below it, um, there's almost no problem at all. All right, um, I can let you in on a secret here. I actually skipped over a step where I didn't record. The bottom of the scabbard was actually done with a material called uh, Warbus, uh, Warbler's Finest. Um, the material has a pretty heavy texture to it, which is why you can see I'm going over the whole thing with Bondo. My initial plan was to use the PVC uh, sheeting to uh, create those end caps. However, due to the fact that it's a compound curve, where it's curving both into the center and around the edge at the same time, it is almost impossible to do without a material designed to do that sort of thing. In this case, uh, Warbler's Finest happens to meet the, uh, meet the bill perfectly, and I'm able to hand shape it around, and then I cut off all the extra material that I didn't need, uh, leaving me with that perfect end cap that you see there. It does have some more cleanup work with it, just due to the fact that it is so uh, textured. Uh, however, the trade-off was the fact that I didn't end up spending 15 minutes getting angry at it, and then try after try after try to get something that I would be happy with. In this case, it was worth the time to spend waiting for Bondo to dry, just to end up with a good solid product uh, on the overall. Alright, once I'm done with this whole process, it's clean up, sand, sand, sand. Um, there's really no wrong answer here. And uh, I will go over this whole thing with um, a fair amount of, uh, of paint and primer. Right now, I don't know if you can actually see them on there, but uh, this whole thing has been painted. And uh, this ensures that I have good adhesion over all the surfaces. This is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, I went ahead and primed and painted the whole thing blue. The blue was to ensure that I had a nice clean undercoat. I masked the whole thing off uh, and then I fired the gold at it afterwards. This ensures that the gold accents pop uh, in relevance to the, uh, to the blue accents. So I want to make sure it came together. If you have any other questions, see us there.